Hey guys, uh, good afternoon. Uh, we're, we're very stoked to uh, be hosting uh, another panel this year. Um, the, the difference uh, for us up here this year than uh, the years before is that uh, this year we're up here as a combined company of Experticity and ReadyPulse. Um, we merged as companies about six months ago. Um, so we're really excited to, to bring to you a, um, another real episode and by, back by popular demand. Uh, a great kind of fireside uh, you know, communication and conversation with some rock star uh, modern marketers. Um, as well as uh, as well as a um, a very great kind of authentic uh, social media and uh, and marketing uh, influencer, uh, we've been doing this panel for I think this is our fifth time now, and we started uh, we started off because a, a lot of our clients at Ready Pulse had said, hey, help us figure out what the ROI is of uh, our sponsored athletes, and we got to figure out how to activate them on social. What do we do with them? How do we measure them? Um, but today, I think uh, you know, you're here and we're here for something different, something more transformational in our industry and in marketing overall. Um, I, I think we all see the trends out there that half the population is under the age of 34. And that Generation Z and those millennials, guess what? They don't like ads. In fact, nobody likes ads. And so if you're producing a great product, whether you're brand new and trying to break through to the four hours that people are spending on their phone and on social media every day and people are checking their phones you know, 40 to 50 times a day, how do you actually get in the feed versus out of the feed? And those people under 34, they're looking to connect with your brand. They want to understand your brand story. They want to associate themselves with what you're all about. And as marketers, and as modern marketers, really the only tool we've had are ads. And if ads aren't working because people are, blo are using ad blockers to block it on Chrome, they're doing, um, using ad blocker technology like Crystal Apps to block ads on their phone, nobody wants to consume more ads. So then how, as a modern marketer, as a brand, just as an industry, do we actually do the thing that we actually went to school for and started a brand to do, which is to tell real authentic stories, to provide inspiration and aspiration to our consumer, to show them what's possible? And how do we do that in an organic, authentic way, kind of at scale, that we feel good about? We all know that storytelling is the best marketing. We all know that uh, the best storytellers are our best consumers but we all know it's very hard to put our best kind of consumers and customers front and center of our marketing. Well, we're pleased today to spend an hour with you to talk with some fantastic uh, marketers and influencers, really about kind of all things uh, influencer marketing, why the shift is happening from paid media to earned media, why the shift is happening, happening from analog to digital, how to do this right and, and how to do this uh, and what happens if you do this wrong. So thanks so much guys for for being here, what I would love is if you guys can all do uh, just quick intros around uh, who you are, what company that you work with, talk a little bit about what your company does, and then your role within, uh, within uh, marketing or as an influencer. So uh, Tyler, why don't you start off? <clears throat> Hello everyone. Um, my name is Tyler Porches and I'm the VP of Marketing for a brand called Kula. Uh, we are based in San Diego, and we are a uh, yeah, manufacturer and distributor of premium, organic, and natural sun care products. Um, for us, really the most important thing is getting people to wear sunscreen um, and wear something that they like. And a, a story that we hear all the time when we you know, talk to people about the brand or when we look at them and, and ask them, hey, how did you get introduced to it? It's been through a friend, it's been through a coworker, it's been through someone who is a user of it. Um, and I don't think that's unique necessarily just to our industry, but in sun care in particular, you know, everyone touches it right away, smells it, feels it, and they wanna make sure it works. So for us, influencer marketing is incredibly important and I get the great role and task to run a team of people who are fantastic at their job and making sure that we have authentic and relevant people talking about the product, using the product, and hopefully that translates to a good sell through at our accounts. Hello everyone, my name is Megan Porches and I am running 
digital marketing for Solomon, and we are based right down the road in Ogden, Utah, and we are actually just currently uh, bringing on Ready Pulse uh, into our to manage our athletes and influencers, and we've been working with Expertisity for quite some time. Happy to be here today. Hi guys, my name is Kelly Meyer. I'm the marketing manager at Designer Protein. Um, if you're not familiar with De Designer Protein, we are a premier protein product, and we've had um, influence in the industry for over 25 years. We originally started out as Designer Way, um, and in reaction to the industry changing and our customer wanting to evolve, we've expanded into plant proteins. So we are now Designer Protein, and we offer a full range of whey and plant-based proteins, as well as our expanding into supplements to add into your protein products as well. Hi, I'm Farah Rosenzweig, and I'm a fitness lifestyle influencer um, and content strategist. Um, I work with brands um, and get the word out there about the latest and greatest, uh, what products uh, that I enjoy and what products that should get in the hands of you guys just from my experience and expertise uh, with geeking out with all these type of gear. Hi everybody, my name is Lucas Salberg. I'm with Hydroflask, based out of Bend, Oregon. Uh, we make vacuum insulated water bottles, beer growlers, coffee mugs, food containers. Um, I've been with a company about five years or so, and uh, I oversee our PR and uh, social efforts. Awesome, so really stoked to have a bunch of different type of industries uh, here. That's a good representation of a lot of the uh, you know, spectrum of the outdoor brands. Quick question guys, how many of you sell your products online? Uh, how many of you guys sell your products in store? How many is social a really important kind of conversion channel for you? And when you sell in store, how many are doing that through not your own stores, but through uh, retailers? Awesome. So the majority of uh, perspective that we have at Experticity um, are absolutely these omni-channel uh, type of brands that are very concerned on the top end of the funnel around how you get actually discovered. Um, how you actually consider and look at uh, different websites and social to understand the brand. And most importantly, um, somewhat um, what most of our clients say is the most important influencer, that person who's actually helping you make a product decision when you're actually talking to, uh, to him or her. So at Experticity, we say that people trust people, not ads. And it seems to resonate with a lot of marketers, but also seems to resonate with a lot of these influencers who aren't paid and a lot of consumers who are saying, hey, give us some authentic uh, you know, information so we can connect with brands. What are you guys seeing from your perspectives of you market to consumers and work with influencers all, uh, all the time? What are you seeing as these macro trends around people saying, hey, I, I have this need for authenticity, this need for trust? Who, Megan, you wanna, you wanna start off? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so we always say humans connect to humans, not logos. And we really look to our influencers to humanize the brand and to really to give it some personality. And sometimes you, you can't really do that from a logo, from a brand perspective. And we really rely on our athletes and influencers to give that human perspective and give that human flair. So it's hugely important to us. Cool. Lucas. Yeah, and Hydroflask, we're a very experiential brand. You know, a water bottle, you can't just tell by looking at it, uh, you know, how it's going to differ from another. And so we really want to get people to experience the products. Um, and for us, uh, influencers are a great way to kind of showcase that in a visual form and really kind of visually tell that brand story through um, awesome content and authentic content. Cool, and then Farah, I'm sure you, I know you work with you know, dozens and dozens of different brands and, uh, and I know you're very selective about who you work with and you're never paid to you know, endorse any type of products. Um, what, is it, what does it feel like to your, you know, your audiences and your followers on something authentic versus not authentic? How do you, what is your radar up when, when somebody says, hey, this is something that I want you to do, and you're like, hey, that kind of reeks of inauthent inauthenticity. What are, what are the things that you look at about um, trying to bring authenticity to your, to your followers? Um, well, when I work with brands, I want to know the story behind the brand. Like, just let's talk about the product. What is your ultimate goal with the product? And then I like them to tell me just the material used and how it can better me. And I just, I don't want to be paid. I want to test it out and put it out there because I want yep. my, my followers um, to actually trust me. And if I don't like something, I'll let them know or, and I'm going to tell the brand this isn't for me, I'm not gonna endorse this. Do you think your, your followers are savvy enough to know if you get paid or not paid for Well, yeah, for you product? can tell from the story. You can tell from the verbiage used that it's paid. Um, right. You know, 
I learned from an experience my rookie time, like, I think you use the brand a million times in a story, and they're like, this seems like a sponsored piece. And it, it, you know, it really wasn't a sponsored piece, but I had learned I didn't even get my foot out there and test multiple products. So that yep. was my rookie mistake. And now when I work with brands, right. I, I literally, in my living room, I will have 10 different shoes that are all supposed to be very similar and I'll go out there right. for a month and test all of them so I can actually get the best product that's gonna support my needs and tell everyone else out there. And that's I let brands know that. I'm, you know, full front, like, hey, I'm testing everyone, testing your products with everyone. And the brands yep. even wanna know how they stand up to other brands. No, that's a great perspective. Uh, Tyler, I'd love for you to take a crack at this next one. So uh, all, mar all marketers have always known, hey, if I need a boost, I can run an ad, right? I can run a Google ad, I can run a Facebook ad, I can run, um, I can run an eight and a half by 11 ad, right? I know how to do those things, those things are easy. But consumers are really pushing back on that. Um, talk with us around, is there really this shift between kind of traditional paid advertising to earned media around trying to kind of invest in people, not ads? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think everyone here hopefully most um, agree with that statement that there is a, a big transition right now between traditional spend and uh, this new ambassador influencer uh, spend. And for us, talking from a, a personal experience, you know, we're a smaller um, but growing brand. And though we would love to, or back in the day would have loved to do multiple full page spreads and you know, print magazines, um, we just didn't have the budget for it. And now I think with the availability of different software systems, with our ability as marketers to reach people that are true uh, to what our core beliefs are in an effective and cost efficient way, it's where we're going and where we are going to be putting more and more of our budget um, over the next few years. Awesome. Kelly, I, I love your perspective on this. Um, previously to, uh, from Designer Protein, you were at Stance. Um, you're a kind of digital native, you know, super uh, savvy on social and digital. Not everybody who's an exec at these brands who are as old as I am are comfortable with that stuff, right? It's, we, uh, some folks couldn't tell you the kind of nuances between a uh, between a Snapchat and an and, and Instagram. Um, when you are pushing and saying, hey, we have to invest in people, not ads, um, what are kind of the, some of the hurdles that you see from like different execs or, or what are the, some of the things that you've seen that actually resonate where you can say, hey, you know what, an ad only lasts for as long as you pay it and it goes away, but if you invest in a person and that advocacy, that, you know, that shelf life lasts forever. So how do you, um, how, how have you uh, put together those business cases in, in both uh, Stance and Designer Protein? Yeah, so I think depending on the company, um, I think Stance happens to be really savvy in the digital, digital space, so there's not a huge buy-in that you have to get, but um, working in other companies as well, I think that there's the old impression that um, impressions are all that matters, and that's all you're, that you're going to get in analytics and digital. And that space has really changed to evolve with click-through rates, and you can see complete conversions and shoppable Instagram feeds. I think that's one of my biggest tools is whenever I can show that we are engaging with the customer in a really organic way and we can show direct click-through to um, shop or at least to the site so we can engage them further, um, that's my biggest kind of toolbox is to say that that's going to show yep. real conversion. I think that ads these days, you have bots that people pay for. So you can say that you've gotten millions of impressions and you can have a zero click-through rate or a banner ad can get can get prime location above the fold and you can still see no click through. So as much as I think that people can be comfortable with that um, and that's what's been tried and true, it's really not going to actually show any sort of relationship with your customer sure. and through to conversion. I think to looking even farther, print ads are the death I think of marketing. I think they're difficult. Um, I think again, it's you checking a box and saying, well, we put marketing money and gotten it in front of our customer and that's really working. but. Um, I think when you really take the time to educate your C-suite level on the difference between a banner ad and a social promotion, a Facebook post, an yep. Instagram sponsored post, all these kinds of different tools and how they're connected together to really show a cohesive um, perception of your brand and really get you in the, there's so much analytics to get right in front of your customer that it's an amazing experience. And I think if you can get them to sit down and take the time, which right. can be hard, um, but once you get them there, I think that it's a process of proving it. 
I also love too, to do a side by side. So I'll put a print ad and then take that exact amount of budget and put it towards something social and show that I'm really getting more conversion and more for my money. Cool. And, and so you guys all use uh, Ready Pulse and Expertricity. What is, what is or has been the biggest hurdle to those execs to say, hey, we're, we're gonna change our marketing. We're actually gonna market it to people. People both who are authentic, non-paid, and social, and both um, key people who are selling our product factually up to date about what we're doing and getting the product into their hands. So we're gonna make an investment in people and uh, you know, authentic, trusted people. What's been the toughest thing to somewhat position to them, or is there anything that they, they generally you know, come back and, and say, hey, I don't get this part, or something that you have to build a business case around? I mean, I'd say, I mean, the, the biggest hurdle for that is time, uh, because we talked earlier about yeah. uh, the key is building relationships, and for us, right. building those relationships turns into brand loyalty, which then turns into uh, those impressions and leads into conversions, and the, you know, in the influencer case, it just amplifies to their audience and creates new fans. Uh, but, you know, like with PR, that, that takes time to do that. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like in Hydroflask's case, uh, you know, we're a fairly young company, and especially back in the beginning, we had really small budgets, uh, and so our brand grew very organically. Uh, but over time, uh, it, people, you know, people shared, and social was a huge part of our brand growing. Right. And we grew into be the most recommended and most gifted. But a lot of that was because of authentic social, and yep. another part of that is just authentic influencer marketing. And so. Uh, to, a bit to what Farah was talking about earlier from like the brand side for us like before we even work with anybody we sit down and have a conversation about values and just make sure that we're aligned from a value standpoint because right. again consumers these days especially millennials are super savvy and the days of, of duping people in marketing are certainly over um, which you know like crazy quirky ads and things like that but um, but yeah that authentic content is just gonna, it's gonna come out. People can tell, yep. people are savvy. And so building those relationships, knowing like for us that these people are true fans, they're true right. brand loyalists, and then that's gonna convey to their fans and their audience that this is, this is, this is the truth. So, so we picked this panel partially because we always ask, hey, what are some of the brands and marketers that you admire and you wanna see what their ROI is? Um, some of these things are like, hey, what are things that you're wrestling, wrestling with and what do you wanna be able to see? Two years ago, it was the, um, you know, we had the Skull Candies and, and the O'Neills on stage, and it was all about, hey, um, how do you actually manage your sponsored athletes, the GoPros, the Red Bulls? But now it's beyond just, hey, I want to build a brand and I, I want to get a sponsored athlete team. I actually want to be able to have all of these different tiers of influencers for my different, you know, segments. Um, why do you guys think that shift has been enabled? I mean, uh, uh, Megan. Yeah, I think, I mean, we talk a lot about the, the, the shift from macro influencers, people over 100,000, maybe 150,000 followers, to these micro influencers, people that have, you know, 5,000 up to 50,000 influencers. And we, what we're really seeing is, I mean, consumers are smart. We've talked about it tonight. We can't really trick, con to, we've talked about this afternoon, we can't really trick these consumers. They're smart. They, they, know, they can smell it when something's forced. So uh, some of these... Uh, these people that have lower followers are much more influential. They have much higher engagement rates. They're, they're talking about something a little bit more naturally. And I think that it, it all works in an ecosystem, though. For us at Solomon, it's really important to still have these really pinnacle peak uh, elite athletes because those people are the people that influence these micro-influencers. And then the micro-influencers influence regular people and at the yep. end of the day our goal is to have regular people talking about our brands and our products around the dinner table or at a barbecue so I think it's an ecosystem that all works together yeah for, uh, for sure Farah so from to piggyback on that um, I, I have a smaller inf um, following scale but my followers actually like message me personally so I can like actually get down and dirty with them. And I think that's the coolest part is that I know them personally and I can say, hey, yeah, maybe this watch isn't right for you. You might want to try this watch. I didn't enjoy it that much, but the features that you're looking for are right up there. And so like you can definitely get to a personal level. Right. And you know, I'm an average person and they know that I have a regular job and just like them and I understand their challenges. And so I could say, this is easy to use. You don't right. have, it's out of the box, ready to go. And so um, opposed to an athlete where 
they're educated on this. They have a team to get them ready to use this stuff. They have thousands of other products. You don't even know if yeah. that's the actual product that they use all the totally. time. You know, so there's a lot of questions with that. With the, a regular influencer that's uh, really passionate about it, you can get to that personal level. Yeah, it's a fantastic trend that we see. Um, go ahead, Lucas. I was just going to say, too, a lot of it depends on the brand. You know, I mean, with Hydro Flask, we're very much about the in-between moments and not so much, you know, whereas Solomon, you guys have awesome athletes and, uh, you know, very performance driven. But, but for us, we're more about the in-between moments. You know, we, will, we would never use the silhouette of a climber on the peak of a mountain in our, in our marketing because that's not who we are. You know, we're more, we're more the brand who you go out hiking or mountain biking with a group of buddies and then you come back to the trailhead, you crack open your growler, cheers over true pints and then talk about the wipe, epic wipeout your buddy had, you know, that kind of thing. But in line with that, like we, we use some athletes, but we, we use a lot of people that are more in, I don't want to, I don't want to say niche communities, but sure. uh, like the van life is a great example. I mean, we, it's a very homogenous group of folks, um, super close knit word spreads fast. And it's just, I mean, it's an awesome, it's an awesome movement that also fits really well within our brand lifestyle. Yep. And so we use that in marketing a lot because our, it's very authentic. Our products um, fit really well in that lifestyle. And right. we're buddies with a lot of these guys and they use our products too. And so it's just, it's a win-win situation. Yeah, we, we absolutely see that as, as one of the, certainly the, the trending uh, the marketing execution is, is, is to say the consumer is always on. They're always on their phone. They're always getting messages. They're always um, having these signals. And how, as a marketer, do you actually get your brand and fit your brand in the conversation on your own? You can't. So how do you enable and empower your passionate uh, you know, consumers and customers to allow them to tell your story for you so that you can create really relevant content in the channel in which your consumer wants to consume that content? It's, it's difficult to be able to do that, but these brands who have executed well against that it makes all the difference in the world that they've invested in people with a long shelf life of execution versus an ad that goes away as soon as that publication goes away or that Google uh, keyword goes away or that celebrity sponsorship goes away. Um, so Tyler, Megan said something about she wants to be able to get to the micro influencer that sits at the dinner table and has a great conversation. Um, we talked about retail. What's the challenge in terms of you know, getting to those people when because we were talking about today, Kula, um, you guys might not be able to tell with these bright lights, but I'm, uh, I'm a bit on the pale side, just a bit. Um, and, and Kula was an amazing product for me to actually put on my face, but when you put it on your face, it's a, it's a completely different experience. You can't, you can't find that online. So how do you, like, what's the challenge for you to you know, find um, how those people who are uh, uh, talking about your product in stores and selling Kula in stores to be able to get them kind of factually up to date about your product, get the product in their hands. What are some of the challenges on that and, and why is that so important? Yeah, um, I would think one of, one of our challenges at the beginning was bandwidth um, internally. Being a smaller brand, we wanted to do everything and you can't do everything um, or at least you can't do everything great. And that's really what we want to do from our product to our marketing. And so just like you mentioned, this personal conversation about uh, uh, positive feedback and uh, experience with our product, that's really what we require. Um, we're not logoed on shirts, um, though I have a water bottle here that is a promo piece. Um, it is negative if you see our product on someone's skin. That's not good typically in the sun care industry. You don't want to have to see your sunscreen on. So we really require people to talk about this experience that they had. Now, in particular to retail, um, that last one meter or 3.5 feet um, is really important um, to us because at the end of the day, we are a cosmetic. We're, we're actually an FDA drug. Um, and so you really need that personal recommendation that when you walk in the store and say, hey, what do you recommend as far as sunscreens? I'm prone to having irritation from a certain ingredient. Uh, it's really important that our retail associates are up to date, uh, that they're knowledgeable, and not necessarily just on terms of rifling off all these bullet points that uh, was very old school marketing where you'd have your beautiful static ad and great creative and then, oh, all right, let's hit our hero bullet points. Uh, we really need it as someone saying, you know what, I wear this product. Um, 
I trust it. You know, sunscreen in the past was often seen as a trade-off. You know, yeah, you get protected from the sun, but it wouldn't feel great on your skin. This is something I wake up in the morning, I put on personally, and if they throw out something in regards to us being primarily organic or made in the USA, icing on the cake. Um, but really, it's that personal experience with the product, and that's where we are a, a new customer of Experticity. Um, we launched essentially in May, and we've had tremendous uh, results so far in our national accounts, uh, like in Alta and Nordstrom. Um, our independent accounts, we have a rep force. They, they, we do utilize it, and it's been fantastic. Uh, but they also have a little bit of a different level of expectation when it comes to the service that they get from their independent rep. Um, they typically you know, want to have a sit down, hour long. They're talking to estheticians, et cetera. Uh, but that, one, that last little bit is incredibly important. Yep. And that comes from people using it. And that's where, you know, again, us having uh, the ability to get more products into people's hands, more people talking about it, uh, that's key. That's key for our marketing. M makes, a, makes a ton of sense, right? If, if you know about the product and you have the product, um, you're, you're hopefully going to be more effective for that consumer. Absolutely. Well, to jump on that, like, it helps with someone like me. I see someone looking for sunscreen. I'm, I'm a cool fan, and I just met him today. So, um, <laughs> but it's... You know, they're looking at different sunscreens, and I'll just kind of walk by casually. You know, women talk in stores. I'm like, oh, go with that brand. That's really good. I'm wearing it right now. You know, and they're like, awesome. oh, okay. Thank you. you. Know, so, <laughs> so, uh, so Farah, so uh, we, we know that retail is important for everybody. Um, and we know that when you get to that last meter, that last mile, whatever, that, you know, having somebody that you actually trust to give you the right product recommendation is helpful. A lot of our customers say, hey, get us to, get people to the store. And that store could be a retail store, that store could be an e-commerce store. Part of that brand awareness and consideration is certainly through social. You said, hey, you don't have a lot of followers. If, if followers aren't the right metric, if, if these guys are modern marketers or anybody's a marketer and saying, hey, I have limited, as you said, time to be able to put into it, um, tell us why the, there's a better outcome or a better metric rather than followers. For, a, uh, for an influencer? It, I firmly believe it's engagement. Engagement, because, awesome. Yeah, it's a, you want to talk about the product. It's not, you know, right now so many people are lazy that they're just yeah. like, 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 like. You know, like, <laughs> that doesn't say anything. It's what's the conversation. So if I talk to right. five people today about one product, that's five more conversations than 10 likes, right. you know? And then the chances of those five people actually going to that website or going to the store you're probably 90% likely to make a sale, you know, and, sure. and I can provide them with, oh yeah, here you can get it on Amazon, oh, the best deal is here, or wait till next week, you know, right. I can give them the inside scoop, and I'm like, oh, thanks, you know. So I'd love to hear from the marketer side of it, because I, I, we firmly agree that engagement is a far better metric than followers. However, um, there is a large portion of our clients today who have to have a measurement to their bosses to say, I have X amount of Instagram followers. Look at how big my Instagram following now is. And you almost have to excuse yourself because you say, is it 2010 or is it 2016 uh, on that? Um, so how, how have you guys been able to break through that kind of vanity metric of followers versus, versus engagement when you're looking at you know, kind of influencers in your marketing? I was going to say, just to add to what Farrah was saying too, one other thing, just to take it a step further, we look at is engagement as a percentage of audience. Awesome. Uh, because that means not only are your audience members engaging with your posts, but then they're sharing it, and then their friends who may not be following you uh, engage with it. And so, I mean, we've had some you know posts that are like three, four hundred percent engagement as a percentage of audience, which means tons of people who aren't following you are then engaging with it, and then they're more than likely to come to your brand, to click through to your website, that's and can ultimately convert. And so, for us, that's. That's our main metric we focus on. Yep. Engagement is huge, but then engagement as a percentage of audience because it not only means our followers are, are, are following what we're doing, but it also means that they're followers. It's the same thing with uh, you know, look-alike audiences and things like that. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Like, also, working with brands, like I tell them, hey, don't just sell a product. Tell us your story. Like, right. I think we spoke about this, like, you know, there's a study out there. I am digging deep into this study. Can you give me some advice on that and, like, you know, what your expertise is? Because they're, they're a product and they should know the background and study and give me tidbits on that. And so if you get that brand saying, hey, they're experts in this, yep. then they'll recognize that brand and then they're more likely to even try that product. Absolutely. 
So we're going to take questions in about 15 minutes. Um, there's a rumor uh, that the best question may or may not uh, get access to the best party at OR, which is a tequila mixer uh, tonight at 7.30. Uh, there, the, it may or may not, uh, multiple uh, uh, wristbands may or may not be handed out uh, today. So um, we'll, we'll do questions in a bit. So we centered on, uh, you got to have the who, right? So it, it, it's, not the, it's not the ad, right? We know the, the nobody came in here and said, hey, I want to do more print ads. Nobody said, hey, I'm, I'm a masterful Google PPC brand marketer and, you know, I'm, I'm you know, click through and, you know, to, to make sure that I'm, uh, you know, getting the lowest cost per lead on, on, on somebody in my store. Um, you guys are all talking about the who, right? An investment in a person to be able to tell your brand story. Now that you got the who, it, it, it's a little bit about the what, like what do you do next? Um, so without talking necessarily your dirty laundry, tell us some, like, what's really gone bad? Like what have you seen either that you've been a part of or, or that you've seen where you said, this is influencer marketing just gone wrong. Like poster child from it that you're using with your teams that said, hey, we are never going to do this. You don't have to name names, but I, we'd love to hear about some campaigns that you guys have seen that just um, has either been not your brand ethos or just one that you just have, have not agreed with at all. Um, so when I first started working with influencers, it was the mommy blogger age, and that was all basically brands like Kimberly Clark, Huggies, um, Nestle wanting to have authentic relationships with their customers, but it was through mommy bloggers, and they were really just trying to cover costs of the babysitter to write the post. So it was really not a lot of um, interaction in terms of what the content was going to be, and so what we provided was... Uh, what we call like a press sheet, and it was just basically the general information per our client. I worked at an agency, so per the client, what they wanted us to convey. And oftentimes, we would knowingly give them, give the bloggers this content, and they would copy and paste. And so it was the most inauthentic way to engage someone. It was just, it was horrible to look at. And we would deliver these results with you know millions of impressions to our clients. And I kind of felt guilty because they were paying for something that wasn't probably going to result in really anything. Is that what you actually deliver? Say, so here's the impressions. We would. That was the yeah. And impressions what they, were, were what they it mattered. On it? Were they like yeah? Yeah. If we got them 14 million fives. impressions, that's all that mattered. And you know whether that was any sort of engagement or yeah. you know comments would be like two comments. That was right, right. nothing. So to your point about really engaging with customers and really answering their questions, that was not at all what we did. And it was really yeah. just kind of cringeworthy. And I'm glad that now the blogger marketing world has kind of evolved. Much better way to yes, put it. What, yes. what is cringeworthy? So any other cringeworthy stories? I have a pretty good one. All right. Yeah, this is probably... Keep, keep this, it clean. Uh, this is the worst. Uh, yeah, it just... I've... Not at Solomon, but in a, at a previous position, I was working with a lot of kind of elite level athletes. And uh, it, back before, there was a software that I used to kind of get the message out in one concise... Um, delivery, it was a lot of emails back and forth. It was like, hey, I need you to share this message or talk about this key product point. And in, in one particular instance, uh, there was one new product that we wanted this athlete to share. And uh, she's like, oh, can you just text me the image? Or So what, what ended up happening was she did a, a screenshot of the, of the iPhone, of her screen, and just posted the, the iPhone text that had the image and the copy that I wanted her to put underneath it. So I think that's absolutely the worst. And she has a, quite a bit of, quite a few followers and that, it got, it got a lot of engagement for the wrong reason. So <laughs> that's the worst I've seen. Thank you for sharing. Me. <laughs> yeah. You I'm, are definitely invited to the Mixer. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> right. um, I wouldn't say necessarily it's cringeworthy, but I just see a lot of brands doing just that, where you, you're so excited to activate your influencer, your ambassador team, that you end up, you know, you send out a mass email or through a campaign, through whatever software you're using, and automatically on one day, you have 90% of your influencing audience or your group posting the exact same thing, the exact same photo, the exact same copy, and it's just boring. It, yeah. To me, it just looks really, really lazy. Um, and very inauthentic. And so I think that's really part of it too, is to identify your objectives with building out this big program, which we've all uh, discussed, you know, it takes time to do it well. 
and to bucket your influencers and your ambassadors into either different groups or into your different company-wide objectives. If it's for pushing a particular brand of skis or a model of skis, great. Uh, if it's promoting a different or a new product based upon your skin type, then you can tailor it so that you know your influencers are well organized, that they'll communicate the message which is proper for them to do, uh, not just in a way that you know it looks like they regurgitated it from the mothership. Well, and I think that's a really good just gut check point for all, all of us marketers and, and everybody trying to grow a brand is are what we doing, it, it, does that feel good? You know, does it feel, what, what feels good? Placing a Facebook ad or actually investing in somebody who's using your product and wants to be part of your brand, promoting them and allowing them to tell your story? What are your consumers looking for? Are your consumers looking for more ads? Are they actually looking for trusted, authentic, relevant, you know, content and information? You guys are all still relatively early in your career. You're a, a fantastic brands. You guys have obviously done things right. Um, so beyond the cringeworthy stuff, which, I think we've all been there where there's, there's somebody who's saying, whether it's an agency or, or some head of marketing saying, we gotta do this because we're under time constraints and this is the only tool I have. Um, but you guys have obviously done something right. Talk us about like, great campaigns that you've been a, a part of or that you've done. I was just gonna add a point to what, to what he was saying to earlier. And, and one thing I think that sometimes that you know, is easy to forget is that influencers are trying to build their brand too. Yep. And that they do have their own voice, they have their own followers and they need to be authentic to who they are to build their own brand. So it's, it's never a one-way relationship. It's always a very reciprocal relationship. So I think because of that, it's so important to make sure that you're aligned on the same page in terms of values and, and who, who you are as a core, yep. uh, who you are at the core, both from a brand and an influencer, make sure that aligns and translates into a very authentic voice. Because otherwise, yeah, it's not gonna come across as authentic. Totally. Yeah, please. My pick from an influencer grammar nerd standpoint is the campaign has millions of grammar errors or spelling errors, <laughs> and I just go, oh, that's a big fail. And then the right. next day, I'll see the correction, but it's already been sent out. So well, and, and if marketers copy. and if marketers go from being focused on campaigns and saying I have a deadline to actually market this, and they think of their consumer, which is always on, and they start to think kind of evergreen type of of, of marketing. Uh, our client, uh, the North Face, does a fantastic job of this through a kind of highly curated group called the TNF Locals around an always-on conversation that they're promoting that generates brand awareness. They launch pro uh, products through them, generates traffic to the website, obviously sales, but it's an always-on conversation. Uh, walk us through kind of uh, you know, other types of campaigns or evergreen uh, type of activations that you guys have been a part of, that you guys have done that, that have worked well for you guys. Um, well, we, we did a review campaign, um, which, you know, we're always on the up and up. If we provide product to anyone to do a review, it's always with the assumption that they're going to give an honest and open review and disclose of that. Um, and we've had some that have, you know, done exactly that. They've done the review and they've given it, you know, a mediocre re uh, rating. And that was a shame on our part for not identifying their personal needs and giving them a product that maybe wasn't right for them. Um, and I totally blanked on the question. It was just, uh, tell us about some good, um, some oh, good yeah, results. Oh yeah, right, the review. Uh, some good campaigns. So, so yeah, so one of our big corporate uh, or company-wide objectives was to somehow populate and uh, promote the fact that we had launched within a, a major retail, a national retail partner. And reviews do matter. And though, you know, we have a, a suite of options to be able to host different forms of reviews on your own website, um, sometimes you don't have that luxury to do it on a third-party website that you have no control over uh, who is buying it uh, and of course hopefully themselves they're trying to promote the fact that they want to get reviews but reviews do matter um, however you slice it and so we want to at least get the ball moving and what we did and have found actually that once you almost get one or two reviews things start to populate thereafter um, I think it's kind of like I equate it to when you see a lineup, people just keep adding to that lineup, regardless of whether or not they know what they're lining up for. Yep. Um, it takes you know, that first person to line up to create that chain effect. Cool. And so we ran a, a program like that and had a, you know, over a few hundred reviews populate through products which we tried to curate, um, again, which were appropriate and had a great, great result and met with the buyers 
afterwards at our yearly review, and that was one of their top uh, campaigns that they individually promoted to their C-level people, saying, hey, this awesome. is a brand uh, who went the extra mile. And, and how did, did uh, w beyond the number of just like campaigns, were, were you able to at least anecdotally tie that to consideration or purchases uh, at all? Yeah, I mean, we, we can make, as marketers do sometimes, some pretty good uh, estimations yeah. of how, and you know, we're looking at numbers, you can sometimes make them speak to something uh, or to whatever, really. But in our case, yeah, it definitely had a positive Fantastic. correlation. And we have an open, uh, very open conversation with uh, this particular group as well. So we were able to say, hey, what did you see after we did this? You know, was it positive for you? What was the feedback? And everything was, Thumbs up. Fantastic, awesome. Megan. Yeah, just to kind of build on off of some campaigns that have been successful. Uh, with Solomon, we're actually just in the process of implementing Ready Pulse, uh, but I've been involved with several other ambassador program launches in the past. And one of the main takeaways that I've learned is to really, first of all, do an assessment of your, of your group of ambassadors and really just see what are their strengths? Are they really great at posting amazing photos? Are they stronger in video? Um, and then really setting an equal value exchange from the very front, from the very beginning. Like, all right, this is what we expect from you as an ambassador. This is what you'll get in return as a company. And then kind of have like a third bucket that's what we'd like you to do. And a combination of, of learning what their strengths are and then setting those expectations, building campaigns where you know these ambassadors are going to be set up to succeed is total is key because we might have a company-wide initiative where we're like man we have this great video we want regular people to create videos as well yep. but if our ambassadors are really strong in creating recipes for example or creating photo content that's just going to be a miss so yep. that's a big awesome. takeaway that's a great point not not all influencers are equal yeah and if i can add to that too sorry um it's that offline approach which we briefly touched on um one of the earlier questions where yeah that is such an important part that some people are maybe not as online, they're not as social savvy, they don't particularly sure. live uh, a huge life in the digital space, but as far as an offline influencer, they're the best person. They're the one, like Megan mentioned, talking to you about their bike that they just bought while they're cooking hot dogs. Um, they're the ones that cause that other whole bit of uh, intent to purchase that aren't necessarily visible on the online side, but are incredibly important on the offline side. Yeah, absolutely. I think from an influencer, besides product reviews, um, I'm like, oh yeah, like I'll probably post something, five things that were in my bag this week at OR, and right. like really get to down to the grit about why I had this product, what, what I used it for, and I probably didn't use it for the right reason, but I just needed it, and it happened to be in my bag, and that's what I used it for, and it gives them like uh, other people ideas of what other reasons this product Very cool. Is so, so from an influencer view, because we get this question a lot, which is I'm a marketer, hey, what campaigns do I run? What should I do? Which is uh, back to what Megan's saying is what, it is what is an influencer actually going to respond to? Uh, Farrah, can you tell us like how much is too much, uh, like to, you know, too much direction and, and what is not enough from, uh, uh, from a brand? Well, working with brands, uh, I really don't like it when I don't like it when they give, don't give me the links. They don't give me an, yep. just enough information to educate me. Yeah. Um, and then I just don't like it when, when, if I post something and they come back the next day, ooh, we forgot, can you tweak it this way? Can you, and 99% <laughs> of the time I say no because right. this is my honest opinion. Um, I won't name a brand, but I review or I tested a headphone product and they really wanted to break out into the runner, um, the running industry. And I tried it for running going like maybe five minutes into my run, the headphone came out, it was bouncing on me, it was so uncomfortable, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't write a running review, I wouldn't write um, a training plan and how I use the music, I wouldn't include them, and I said, you know, I really like using your headphones for cleaning my house, and I like using your headphones when I walk my dog. Right. And so that's what I, I wrote about, and that's what I presented to my followers, and I, I they kept on pushing and I was like, look, I don't want to work with you if you're going to continue to push me because right. I'm really being as authentic, authentic and this is what I found the product to be good for. Well, it's a fantastic example of uh, all influencers have different types of uh, value for you and if you're not tapping into them to get product feedback and focus groups and surveys and, and having them as a trusted consumer and tester, you're definitely missing something out. So that it sounds like they, they jumped a couple steps um, beforehand. 
Kelly, Lucas, any, any great campaigns that you've seen, been a part of, um, that, uh, that you'd want to share? I think um, one that I experienced is really kind of um, taking your fans and making them really feel like influencers. I think we've talked a lot about influencers that they're, you're engaging because they have a particular influence, but I honestly think your best army is your fans and the ones that are really dedicated. Um, a great example is at Stance. They have um, a hashtag that is ridiculously popular. I don't even know how it came to be, but um, if you look it up on Instagram, it is tagged in every photo and people are so happy to talk about their socks, which I think socks having, before I worked there, it was like the weirdest thing ever to talk about, but they want to talk about it, they want to promote it, and I think that that was something that was a huge learning for me was um, empowering your fans to be your influencers and have them be your base. And you can certainly add on extra influencers that are um, gonna add extra value through content or they have yep. influence and can drive maybe conversions and do a little extra, but um, don't forget about your customers and making them kind of do be brand advocates for you. They are the easiest influencers to get and they are probably your best. Um, I think that, you know, obviously the more manipulation you have in terms of, like you said, um, you know, talking with an influencer and trying to get a certain message out, um, you're always risking having it be manipulated or um, inauthentic. But if your fans yep. are talking about you, like it, engage with it, keep that hashtag going, let them know, because that was a huge learning for me even was the power of hashtag and, you know, how far that goes and how much that gets the brand out. Yeah, absolutely. And I 100% agree with that. I mean, we... I, you know, we don't have huge photo budgets or anything like that. And so we do a lot of things that encourage our fans to create content. And people are stoked if you post their content on your feed. You know, I mean, people are pumped about it. And it just, I mean, it increases their following. And, you know, they get to tell their friends that they, they're on the feed of a brand that they love. And, I mean, it's a, it's a win for everybody, you know. But for, for brands that may not have large budgets for photography, I mean, it's, it's such a win, too, because these people are are brand loyalists and so they're they're posting authentic content and if you do encourage them to do that you're going to get enough content to be able to filter that so that it is through your brand lens and it's still you know you can still curate it yeah. to your to your brand as well um, so we we certainly do that and then we use influencers to, to to build on top of that too with you know things like takeaways and uh, you know product pushes and, and such awesome so really great, uh, really great campaign ideas, right? Generating product reviews, hey, what's in my bag? Kind of evergreen, you know, hashtag uh, campaigns, uh, you know, content share and create campaigns. So we, we've talked about the who, the finding the authentic influencer, both, you know, kind of online and, and in the store. We talked about the what, which is like, what kind of, kind of campaigns do you run to who? And Megan, you had a really good point. Uh, not all influencers are created equal, so have different type of campaigns to tap into different people. And then there's like the, the so what, or to the what effect. So you're running a program, you know, all of you have worked and partnered with Experticity and Ready Pulse, so you're activating social influencers, you're activating in-store retailers, you're doing this well. Um, talk about like what the outcome is, like what, what do you want to see happen, whether it's anecdotally, whether it's an ROI, um, what do you kind of envision um, with being able to execute against these programs? Um, what, uh, what type of effect you'd like to drive? Anybody can start off. Lucas. I mean, ultimately, yeah, we're trying to build our tribe and we're trying to spread our word. And, you know, in the end, we're, you know, we're trying to build a lifestyle brand. So we're never, you know, if you look at our, our posts, it's, it's hardly ever, unless it's a product launch, it's hardly ever the product in your face kind of thing. It's very yeah. much... Uh, a scene, you know, we're, we're building a scene around the product because the product's not the her hero, the customer's the hero. And again, we're an experiential brand, so we're, we're creating this scene uh, in authentic ways and in turn trying to build brand loyalists from that. Awesome, and then how do you know if you're doing a good job? Like what, you, you talked about engagement for influencers. Is there, is there something anecdotally or are you guys using any, any type of just general metrics to say, hey, this is how we've done, you know, we've increased, you know, marginally kind of year over year uh, type of thing in terms of your activities there? Yeah, I mean, metrics certainly comes into play, uh, whether it's, um, yeah, engagement, uh, engagement as a percentage of audience, referral, traffic, uh, that sort of thing. So yep. in the end, you do have to report on something, you know? Sure, sure. Uh, and so, so people like to see numbers. Uh, but I think, you know, so quantitative obviously is there, but qualitative is great too. And it, it certainly plays a part in augmenting the quantitative. 
yep. um, and just you know, pulling comments and to Farah's point, actually responding to comments, you know, and 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 I mean that's where the that's where the stories and that's where the details are. Right. Um, and then you know being able to to capture that and share that. No, it ma makes a lot of sense, right? It, it, we go we started off by saying what. What don't we feel good about? We don't feel good about, hey, here's another ad, here's another ad, here's another ad. But it's a very kind of easy way to say, here was my click-through rate, here's my impressions, here's my conversion rate. Um, we talked about the investment of in people and, and the shelf life in that, and that that is the way to authentically grow the di different brand. How are you guys saying, hey, I found the right people, I did the right things, I manage the right channels, what, what type of business cases are you building, what type of metrics are you using, what type of anecdotes are you sharing kind of internally as your you know, programs um, uh, are successful and, and, and continue to grow? I can, I can answer that a little bit. So we're, based, we're looking at influencer marketing really not as a silo. We're looking at influencer marketing as a complement to our overall marketing strategy. So if you kind of look at the different buckets of paid media, or owned media, paid media, and earned media, that sweet spot is in the middle for us. And as we're setting up Ready Pulse, and we're really like going back and forth, like what metrics are important for us? Do we want to measure this? Do we want to measure that? One of the things that we're really looking at is when we can hit that bullseye in the middle where every all three buckets are working together, and there's that overlap where our influencers are talking about the same thing that's that are the shop professionals are talking about that is matching our global brand campaign that we are talking about with a, a, a an endemic media partner. So that's, yep. it's kind of hard to measure that, but like when we hit that bullseye, that's one of the main things we're measuring. And then there's a lot of measures that come with that, right. but that's kind of how we're setting it up. No, I think it's a fantastic point. Anecdotally, we see that the more that our marketer clients are shifting from their paid media to their earned media, we know that that um, has a lot more kind of intrinsic value to those uh, to those companies for sure. Sure, yeah, please. I think also, one thing you know, from a content standpoint, content is supporting the ultimate sale, yep. and so you kind of have to look at what. There's a few things I look at. Um, I'll notice people, you know, like for example, I was on an airplane and I saw a guy wearing a product that I had worked with and I just, I never said anything that I worked with it, but yeah. just listening to him talk about it and how he got that product onto someone else and someone else, there's a trickle effect. So I'm like, oh, we're doing something right there. That's awesome. And then another thing is, you know, looking at, I call content or photos like bookmark worthy. What are people bookmarking and yeah. going back to? and sharing, forwarding, forwarding that to friends. And I think that's ultimately like something very successful to look at because it's you're getting the word out, you're getting the product out, you're yep. mainly getting the brand out there and getting that trust. Right. And you're not gonna make a sale if you're not getting that trust. And that's where content really comes into play. That's where influencers come to play. They're building that trust and sharing stories. Yeah, yeah absolutely right. It's so hard to produce enough authentic content for consumers to consume. And the, the trust, uh, um, I know we use that word a, a ton, but it's, it's more true today uh, for all of our existing consumers, but all the, the new consumers that are under 34, for sure, it's kind of top of mind. All right, uh, question time. Uh, we get a lot of questions from, uh, from a lot of great folks around, hey, what advice do you have to, to get started in those types of things? Um, we have a microphone that is in back right here. Jessica, can you raise your hand to show people where the mic is? So the mic's right there. Who wants to break the ice? All right. Yes, sir. Please. Uh, thank you for your time and the fascinating conversation. Just going back to the tradi traditional values, do, how important are conversion rates to you? Because at some point in time, the accountant's interested in what is our return? And, and sometimes is it when you pull out of a, a certain marketing segment, that's when you really recognize the impact? I'd just be interested in, in maybe your approaches in that, in that line. And again, thank you for your time. Kelly, you, you, you mentioned that you used uh, kind of metrics with your business execs around kind of shoppable things. You wanna, you wanna uh, hit that one? Yeah, I think, um What's important to me, I think a shoppable Instagram feed, if you don't have one for your brand, you are absolutely missing out. That's a huge and easy metric. Um, 
I think that you want to know that you're building a community and that they're clicking through and purchasing. I think it's your first stop and a great temperature check on are you being effective? Are you putting out great content? Um, are they coming to you first? Obviously, you know, designer protein goes through retail partners and we can get some sales data there, but um, we don't have control over that. So I think if we need to see if we're being effective or not, um, the easiest and quickest way is really to do something like a, if you're with our influencers, we have affiliate links, so we can see if they're clicking, you know, if they're getting people to click through and, and purchase through them or a shoppable Instagram feed because we know that we are directly influencing something through our Instagram. They're staying dedicated, they are purchasing all the way through, you know, what our channels are. So I would definitely say it's important. I don't think it's everything. Um, I think you, in the case of something like an, um, a hashtag, you want to see that you're getting traction. It always comes back. I think it's a hard sell, you know, to your point that people do want to see numbers, but you have to be able to, um, with marketing like this, especially because it's earned, you have to have faith in the long tail. And if you can keep up with them in some way, there's always new analytics programs that you can kind of try to follow that customer across. I would say invest in those so you can see what your return is over time. But um, shoppable Instagram feed and affiliate links are my greatest asset for that immediate check. Uh, social posts never go away, an ad does. So the, the amount of brand impressions that you actually get from a social post that never goes away, that gets searchable, indexed, analyzed, shared, has a far longer shelf life. So the, the, the impressions that you get on the social content produced far away is something from like a, a Google CPC. Lucas. Just, just to add to that too, I think a lot of it depends on the end goals, right? I mean, if, you're, if your number one goal is to, is to convert and drive traffic to your website, that's a lot different metrics and what you're going to report up than uh, to, to amplify your brand, right? So, I mean, social definitely sits high at the top of the funnel and uh, not down low. But if you, you know, if you want it to sit down low, you can kind of rearrange your tactics and your strategies to make that happen. But if you want it to be to amplify and grow your brand, obviously it's going to be up a little higher and it's going to be hard to report on those quantitative metrics in terms of sales and conversions. Uh, but that's when you do get more into like the engagement and, and items like that. What else? Who's next? Yes, sir. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. I like and the hat. Thank you so much. Um, love what you guys have shared. Um, I'm, yes. I have a small stand-up paddleboard company called Shibumi, and we started a few years ago. We have about 26, we call them special agents around the country. And essentially what we do is we send them one or two paddle boards, and, and the foundation of what we do is to get, it comes from heart and passion for getting people on water. So you have a solid foundation of getting people into nature. That's our purpose and our value system. Very but cool. what I'm struggling with is how do I, how do I, under, how do I get a hold of what the, my ambassadors are doing, special agents, and how do I feed it into my feed, and how do I help them with perhaps paying them a fee per feed or something like that, and is there a software out there that I can organize or, or keep everybody on the same page? It's a, when you're trying to run a small business and organize your ambassadors, it's, it could be a challenge. Any advice you have for a small company just starting would be so helpful. Earth, get this man a wristband for the to keep the park. Yeah. All right, who wants to take that one? Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, Re Ready Pulse uh, essentially does just that. Um, it's a it's a means to collectively uh, group and uh, well find, interact with, and manage your ambassador team. Um, you can segment them into different groups. You can push different campaigns out to them, uh, depending on what your internal needs are. Um, I think right off the gate though, uh, great work just getting it started. Um, I always think the biggest hurdle is just doing it, you know, just getting it over with, yep. starting it, starting off small um, and growing it from there. So kudos for sure for, yeah, for starting it. That's, yeah. that's tough to do, great momentum. But there's plenty of people right behind you who are happy to be, who uh, <laughs> are probably tapping you on the shoulder right now. Great question, who's next? Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for your talk today. Just quickly, can someone or maybe the brands can talk about some of the differences or distinctions between choosing an ambassador and choosing an influencer? When you put together these yeah. amazing athletes that go into your teams, you give them the same metrics that you would expect from an influencer? And if not, why? And, and so on. Yeah, great question. Um, I think that you need to look at what type of expectation you have. So when you're looking at an ambassador, I think that it could be anyone from, that could be an athlete that's repping your brand through um, gear or they've got you know affiliate codes that they're handing out on a card. Um, they could be a rep um, and they're really distributing in a more offline sense. 
Um, I think an influencer to me is someone who's a digital focus. They're creating content for me. And that's something I can use on my channels as well as they're getting my name out through theirs. Um, I think it's a little bit more of a richer experience with an influencer and ambassador. I think I have um, just kind of a lesser level of expectation into return in terms of my return. So getting something yeah. back that I can use on my channels, I'm not going to expect from an ambassador per se. An influencer, absolutely, you need to come with social following, digital savvy, um, ready to make content that we can kind of work on together and really kind of tell a brand story cohesively. It's well, well put. We're going to footnote that. All right, where, where's the line? I know there's, uh, there's other questions uh, in the audience. All right. Yes, yes thanks sir. For the, thanks for the speech. Is there uh, uh, any such thing as uh, bad influencers or unintentional influencers? And do you have a strategy of how to deal with that? And by that, I mean we have a monthly subscription box where we have a YouTube unboxer that we prep, and we have six others we have no control over. Yeah. So I, I love that question. Unintentional influencer. Some guy or gal out there who piggybacks onto the influencer campaign has no business being there. What do you what do you do? <laughs> I mean a brand in in the end is the sum of impressions, right? So you can never stop what people are gonna say online, especially. So I would say put more focus and effort into the people that you know align with your brand, are gonna share your vision and share your message um, and just share with what the core of what your brand is all about. So I mean, you, you, yeah, you can never you can never stop anybody online. You can only just feed it in the right direction and give people the right information um, to, to take it in the direction that you want. I would tweet that you can't you can't stop it. You can just feed it. I love it. I love it. I think I have great question. Um, I think that uh, when you give someone product or they get a. a product at a discount they're so they're oftentimes so grateful and they can't wait to talk about it and sometimes they're talking about it in the wrong way sometimes they're taking really bad photos of it um, it's it I think these people have the best intention you just have to they just need a little coaching you give them a little coaching you show them a couple examples and you can turn that like bad influencer to someone really valuable to you and I think Ready Pulse is a great way to coach because you can provide clear expectations of what you want to be shared and then show examples of really best practices. And just a little coaching goes a long way. Awesome. Uh, all right. Well, we're at the top of the hour. So we have uh, Expertricity as a happy hour here at 4.30, 4.30 to 5.30. And we do have a uh, tequila mixer uh, at 7.30. Earth, can you raise your hand up there, has wristbands that will be given out to a selected number, I know there's some limited number, at the Experticity booth at the end. So on behalf of uh, the great modern marketers and Farah, the fantastic influencer, on behalf of Ready Pulse and Experticity, uh, thank you so much to the people like Ron Selvi who, and Earth who put this on, and all of you who, uh, who watched, uh, watched this through uh, for the hour. Uh, we always get a lot of questions to the marketers afterwards, so hopefully you guys can say a lot of questions. But guys, thank you very much. Great job. Well done, my man. Thank you. It's fantastic. Nice job. It's great. Fantastic. It's awesome. Fantastic. Good job. I saw you trying to like one up Megan every time, and I'm like, I'm like, dude, marital advice. Give her the last word. You rocked it, dude. Nice job. Fantastic. I love the earn paid. Um, that was great job. It's fantastic. It's awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you.
Oh, it's quite cool. Uh, this area. Oh, she moving? Wow, that's a big change. Yeah. Coastal life to freezing, frigid cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. How's her kid? Doesn't she have a daughter? Is her daughter cool with that? Or she's son? Going. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's going. She's going. Doesn't mean she's cool with it, but she's going. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering. Yeah. I was wondering. My little prop stage. Yeah. <laughs> it's not it's not quite a table, but it works, you know, like I think it's great. Yeah. For a wedding What time is it, do you know? I don't have a watch on and I'm not carrying my phone. It's like Okay, a couple more minutes. Is it time? I don't have a watch on. All right, I'm just gonna stand here.